In Psalm 91, beloved, we read, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Beloved saints, our help is in the name of this God, the maker of heaven and earth. And may grace and mercy and peace be from him through Jesus Christ and by his Holy Spirit upon you. Let's now read the sacred scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 through 24. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every one another's wealth. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we come into thy courts believing in the efficacy of the person and intercession of Jesus Christ, the power of his cross 
and prayers to bring us near unto thee. We believe in his great mediation, the one who is God and man, able to reach out, as it were, and embrace us, human beings, upon the earth, and the triune God in his arms, and bring us together in himself, uniting not only heaven and earth through his work, but the holy God and the sinful, reconciled and forgiven people, and even bringing us into fellowship with the holy angels over which he is head and Lord. We thank thee, Father, that thou hast brought us to this place, physically or online, to hear the word of God. We believe that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of thy mouth. Evermore give us this food, this bread, this Christ, the bread of life, that we may live. We pray, Lord, that thou would strengthen our faith, the faith too of our children and of the congregation here in Balamina and all those who join with us live or later. We ask, Lord, that together we may present ourselves as the scriptures urge as a living sacrifice dedicated unto thee. And that we, even through our time of worship together, may be renewed in our minds, that we may be cleansed of all of our filth and uncleanness, that we may mount up with wings as eagles, run and not be weary in thy service, walk and not faint. Strengthen us with this might in the inner man, that though we are of ourselves like a valley of dry bones, very dry, that we may be quickened by the spirit of life, that thou may blow upon us with that quickening breath of life, the one whom Jesus breathed forth in his disciples in the gospel according to John, that wind which blows whithersoever it listeth, that thou, Lord God, may not only regenerate thine elect, but also breathe, refresh, and strengthen and enliven us, the ones already engrafted into Jesus. We pray, Lord God, that thou would humble us, humble us under thy mighty hand. We know not all of thy purposes in this present plague, but we know that surely part of it is another occasion for us to examine our own ways, to confess that we are dust and ashes, to confess the sins of ourselves and our marriages and our homes, the sins of our nation, some of which are known to us, that we protest against, that we witness against, and the many of which we do not know. But thou art the God who knows the sins of mankind, how they heap up unto heaven, the God who serves, saves most of thy wrath and judgments for the world to come, even the everlasting lake of fire. But the God who shows thy displeasure by shaking the earth and sending blights and all forms of misery upon the human race as a little indication of the terrible judgment that is coming and a sign that thou art the God who is displeased with the nations as the one who is of purer eyes than to look upon evil and it canst not bear to behold sin. We confess, Lord, that thou art just and thy ways are just and good, and thy quarrel, the holy quarrel of God with the human race, that all righteousness lies on thy side, and that we in our human race are guilty, and that we deserve much more than what we ever receive. We thank thee, Lord God, that there is forgiveness with thee, that not only in thy just judgments thou mayest be feared, but that thou mayest even be feared with a true reverential awe as the God who pardons sins, the God who blots them out, who remits them freely out of 
grace and mercy and peace. We know not, Lord God, how the great work of missions goes on. Because missions involves meeting people, contacting, witnessing. And in most parts of the world, if not all, that's impossible in the current circumstances. And yet the church prays, there is literature, there is a form of witnessing within families and small spheres. We know, Lord, that Christ is busy building a church, gathering in his elect, and that part of that work is bonding the members of local congregations together. And yet in the current circumstances, that isn't possible. But we know, Lord God, that thy purposes are never thwarted, and that thou art the God who finds a way whose word is not and can never be bound. We thank thee, Lord God, for this Lord's Day too, a day of physical rest, although many of us have more physical rest than is usual for us, but especially a day of spiritual rest, not the normal way, but still we can do it as best we can in these circumstances. And we pray, Lord God, for the coming of the kingdom, for the honouring of thy name, for the doing of thy will on earth as it is in heaven. We ask, Lord God, this for ourselves in this place and for the whole church of Jesus Christ united in the praise of thy name, lifting up willing hearts to thee, lifting up pure hands in prayer and offering to thee devotion, sacrificial love and praise. And we ask, Lord God, that thou would accept our thanks and worship, such as it is, purge it through the mediation of Jesus Christ our Lord, and speak comfort to our hearts which are without comfort, because our only comfort lies in Jesus Christ our faithful Saviour. Be with us, Lord God, by thy grace and spirit, in his name. Amen. Let's read now Heidelberg Catechism, the Lord's Day 52, the last Lord's Day of the Catechism. Lord's Day 52. Which is the sixth petition? And this is the one that this sermon will especially address. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is, since we are so weak in ourselves that we cannot stand a moment. And besides this, since our mortal enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, cease not to assault us, do thou therefore preserve and strengthen us by the power of thy Holy Spirit, that we may not be overcome in this spiritual warfare, but constantly and strenuously may resist our foes till at last we obtain a complete victory. How dost thou conclude thy prayer? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That is, all these we ask of thee, because thou, being our King and Almighty, art willing and able to give us all good. And all this we pray for, that thereby not we, but thy holy name, may be glorified forever. What doth the word Amen signify? Amen signifies, it shall truly and certainly be. For my prayer is more assuredly heard of God than I feel in my heart that I desire these things of him. Beloved, the nature of man's existence between the fall of Adam and the return of our Lord Jesus Christ is such that temptations are absolutely guaranteed and completely inescapable. 1 John 5 declares, The whole world lieth in wickedness. 1 Peter 5 says that the devil 
goes about like a roaring lion, seeking those whom he may devour. And the Apostle Paul in Romans 7 teaches that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Those three verses mention the world, the whole world lies in wickedness, the devil as a roaring lion, and our flesh, no good thing dwells in us. And the world, the flesh, and the devil, they're the three mortal enemies that the Catechism states, cease not to assault us. So a temptation in this world between the fall of Adam and the return of Jesus Christ is absolutely certain. Now this evening, beloved, we could talk about temptations in general. But we won't. Instead, we're going to consider temptations that we are especially facing now that are particularly relevant to us during these days of the coronavirus lockdown. Unusual days, strange days, unsettling days, days such as none of us, including the oldest, in our church can even remember the like and yet and yet 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man not absolutely unique all temptation is common to man in the so called human condition of the evil world, our depraved flesh, and the machinations of the devil. Let's look together at temptations arising from the coronavirus lockdown. Temptations arising from one, being limited in our movements, lots of temptations involved in that. Two, being confined to our own homes and three being worried about our futures temptations arising from this coronavirus lockdown being limited in our movements being confined to our homes largely most of us and being worried about our futures Beloved, being limited in our movements is nothing new for God's people as we read in the scriptures. Think of it. Over two million Israelites, that's more than the population of Northern Ireland, over two million Israelites spent 40 years in a camp, which moved, of course, in the wilderness, living in tents, not houses, as a sort of movable refugee camp. In unpleasant surroundings, the wilderness, for decades, 40 years. Over eight centuries later, the Jews were in Babylon, hundreds of miles from their homeland, for 70 years. And there were others in Scripture who were even more closely confined and restricted. John the Apostle, as we read in Revelation 1, was exiled to the small island of Patmos. I think it was about 13 square miles, if my memory serves me right. Innocent men were put in jail. Joseph in Pharaoh's prison in Egypt, Micaiah in Ahab's prison in Samaria, John the Baptist in Herod Antipas's prison, probably in Machairus on the far side of the Dead Sea. The prophet Jeremiah, he was in prison or in the courtyard of the prison or in a pit 
Daniel spent a night in a lion's den, though admittedly, God had shut their mouths. And when we think of the Apostle Paul, we see him in the penultimate chapter of Acts, Acts 27, holed up in a ship in a storm, a raging storm, for 14 to 15 days, the same sort of period we've been in our homes. I know which one's a lot more pleasant. And in the next chapter, he's under house arrest for two years. One very useful thing at the time and since that the apostle did when he was in prison, including those two years in Rome, at the end of Acts 28, is that he wrote amazing letters, his prison epistles, to the churches at Ephesus and Philippi and Colossae and to Philemon about his escaped slave. In his final imprisonment, for he was then taken out and executed and martyred for the name of Jesus Christ, we have the canonical epistle of 2 Timothy. He redeemed the time. And if you want another example of restricted movements, just think about the lame man in Acts 3 and 4 who had to be carried daily to the beautiful gate of the temple to beg. A man lame from birth, a man who was lame therefore for over 40 years, that's limited, limited in one's movements. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Unusual, strange to us, but not unheard of. Circumstances faced by the people of God in different shapes and formed, forms, even in the scriptures. I'm not now going to talk about other plagues and afflictions that has happened to the people of God in the days after the completion of the canon of God's word. So it is that this current coronavirus lockdown means that there are many things which we can no longer do, things which we took for granted. Work is one of them. Some people can work from home. Most of my work actually is from home. So I'm one of the ones probably in that regard least affected. For some people, given the nature of their work, and for some also on account of their health issues, that's not possible. We can't work from home. And other people can and do go to work, and are especially needed at work, especially those in the medical profession. So it's normal, they're out working, that's usual, but even then it's different because it's more difficult and it's more dangerous. And we can appreciate what they're doing. And we hope and pray that the members of this church stay safe and that God watches over you. For others, the limitation isn't work, but they being younger at school, primary school, for the children or high school or university, some school work can be done from home, but it's not easy and it's not the same. And there are all sorts of complications that schools need to work through with their teachers and students involving exams and grades and university entrance, very difficult. There are, of course, many restrictions on shopping, the shops that are open and those that aren't. And then there's social distancing when you go to a shop that is open. And the sports calendar has taken an awful hit, including the sports that our children may play because group sports at school are out. 
but at least some of you could do various activities in your garden. Now for some of us, the fact that there's no gym is a particularly hard pill to swallow, but persevere, persevere. And then of course, there are limitations on our family and friends seeing them outside one's own household. And some people, some people miss hugging, especially hugging their grandchildren. And Ecclesiastes 3 verse 5 says, there's a time to embrace and there's a time to refrain from embracing. And that too lies in the will of God. I've just mentioned a few things and you understand that these are particularly difficult for those who are elderly and with pre-existing health conditions. They have more restrictions and it may well be that they have to endure these for a longer period of time. And I mention all of these factors in connection with Lord's Day 52 and especially the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer because these things lead to certain temptations. Temptations which different people feel in different ways over different issues, feeling frustrated, feeling bored. And then of course, you need to find something to read or do, something good to read, something good to do, as I never weary of saying, this congregation in its bookstore and website has an awful lot of biblical and reformed resources, probably a lot more than the vast majority of you, the members, even realize. Go online, look at that website. There are books advertised there on a whole host of issues, CDs, DVDs, we have magazines, use them. It may well be the case, at least for many of you, that you will never again have as much time or opportunity to use these things until your day, your dying day. Redeem the time. Sometimes the sorts of feelings which can arise through not being able to go certain places and do certain things, especially the ones that you enjoy, that can tempt you to become angry with God, bitter against God. You believe, rightly, that God is sovereign over all things, including what he takes away. You must also remember that he is good in his sovereignty. And that all things, including this, work together for good. Believe that and reinterpret all things in the light of that. And don't go around grumbling and murmuring. That was a temptation, as 1 Corinthians 10 says, with the Israelites in the wilderness. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Don't go around murmuring as if God isn't really good. He just snatches things and takes things away from me that I like. Because that's the behavior not of the children of God, but of spoilt children and brats. And we oughtn't fall into that way of thinking, beloved. That angers the Lord and grieves the Spirit. And when we find ourselves thinking like that, we need to remind ourselves that we have an awful lot to be thankful for. A rich salvation in Jesus Christ, purchased by the Son of God, laying down his life for the sheep and for the lambs. And besides that, we have even yet many good earthly things that we can enjoy. And these things may be taken from us indefinitely, but they will return. Hang in there. We need to pray the sixth petition. Lead us not into temptation in our current circumstances, but deliver us from evil. We know that we're weak in ourselves. 
and can't stand the moment. We know that our mortal enemies, the three I mentioned earlier, the world, the flesh, and the devil, cease not to assault us. Do thou, this is how the prayer is explained positively, do thou therefore preserve and strengthen us by the power of thy Holy Spirit, so that we may not be overcome in this spiritual warfare, that's what it is, but may constantly and strenuously resist our foes till at last we obtain a complete victory. And we need to remember too that even when we cannot go where we want to go, that we live and move and have our being in God. We can't move where we want to go, but we can live and move and have our being in God. Even if that physical movement is restricted, we're still moving in God. In Psalm 73, Asaph said, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Let me read you some verses from the beginning of Psalm 139. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. He knows well we're not as far travelled. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Even if I don't get out of the house for days, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. Cannot attain unto it. And then the psalmist goes on to say that he can't go from God's Spirit or flee from God's presence, even if he went up into heaven, made his bed in hell, or took the wings of the morning and dwelt in the uttermost parts of the sea. That's an appropriate psalm, beloved, Psalm 139 for seen later in connection with this sermon. And of course, we can't go to church either. You're sitting at home on your own or with your spouse and with your kids. And I hope your kids are sitting well, behaving, paying attention. And Mary and I are here in an empty building. It's sad. It's somewhat surreal. David, though, he knew something of this too, though. He describes this in Psalm 63, another good psalm for saying later. He's on the run. He's on the run from Saul. The heading reads, A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah was from the tribe of Judah, he knew that terrain, that's especially where he hid himself when Saul sought to kill him. Verse 9 says, those that seek my soul to destroy it, and that's what was happening at that time, shall go into the lower parts of the earth. And in those circumstances, David couldn't go up to keep the holy days, he couldn't attend the ministration at the tabernacle. And so he writes in the opening verses, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, 
in the past. But I can't do it now. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. And in those restrictive circumstances, restrictive with regard to the public worship of God, David did the best he could. I will bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. He can do that when he's not at the tabernacle and on the run. My soul will be satisfied with marrow and fatness. My mouth will praise thee with joyful lips. I'll remember the Lord upon my bed and meditate upon him in the night watches. He took his turn. God has been his help. He'll rejoice under the shadow of Jehovah's wings and follow hard after the Lord whose right hand upholds him. There is, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, no temptation that has taken you but that which is common to all men. David faced this too. You remember Naomi. She had 10 years without public worship. Now, of course, it was her own fault especially the fault of her foolish husband Elimelech who took her and their two sons into Moab in the first place. That's a long time to be without public worship. God restored her, brought her to repentance and even, and even engrafted Ruth the Moabites into the covenant line. And through her, the Christ would come according to the flesh. And of course, there's no catechism classes for our children, though there are only about three weeks or so left. And of course, if this continues for some time, and we don't know, we'll have to consider further what we should do. Maybe try it yet online, or maybe do it in the summer or at the start of next year. But in the meantime, we're not panicking. But if there are any parents or children out there who are looking for something to do, you can post me the written work for your children. And when I have them all in from that year, if that's what you want to do, we can say more about it later, I'll mark them and send them back. Some of you I know especially miss our Tuesday morning class looking into a wonderful, heartwarming subject, that of saving faith. Our last class began to consider faith from the perspective of trust, leaning upon the Lord, resting upon him, a very appropriate subject in the current situation. We looked in that last class as on other occasions, at Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, including being shut up in your house, unable to go to many places you would love to go, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And on our Wednesday night class, we were looking at Belgic Confession, Article 36, on civil government, the relationship between the church and the state. We've treated an awful lot of principles in that class so far, important principles, helpful principles for me and for those who also were at those classes. We've been studying this topic for months, looking at the revolutionary Radicals, of how Christ said no civil rebellion. And then the pacifist and a Baptist tendency. Important issues too. In the complicated system of church and state now with some of these regulations. One could say that this coronavirus lockdown has two main sides to it. First one that we've considered is you can't go out, you can't do things, at least as you once did. 
And now we're going to treat the other side of the coin. You're stuck in the house, at least most of the time. That presents its own problems, which means it presents its own temptations. Not just, I can't go out and do these things, that brings temptation, but now I'm stuck here. And here are some of the problems we face. If you live alone, you are going to be tempted to feel lonely because you are living even more alone than ordinarily. And therefore, you are tempted to feel lonely, which is not a pleasant feeling at all. And if in the providence of God, you live with unbelieving family members, that difficult situation has suddenly become a lot more difficult. You're going to be in their company for much longer than usual. And you're going to have to deal with them in respect to their entertainment, usually foolish and ungodly, the sort of drivel that the TV churns out, soap operas and horrible material like that that numbs the mind to say the very least. What absolute rubbish. And sickens the soul. And then if you're in a home with unbelieving family members, they're going to struggle. They are going to struggle. And they'll become, they may well become more irritable than normal, more obnoxious. They may have a go at you. And then maybe you too, in those difficult circumstances, being locked up, as it were, spending more time with them as they become more ratty. And you're tempted to respond in kind. In Psalm 120, because as 1 Corinthians 10 says, there's no temptation that befalls you that isn't common to mankind. Psalm 120 as the psalmist saying in the church singing, Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. And that's where you are at the present time, dwelling in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. A lot of grief there. Let me read you a couple of verses from Micah 7, the last chapter in that minor prophet. The son dishonoreth the father. The daughter riseth up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. And maybe that's what you're experiencing right now and you're concerned that it may get worse. And you're right, it may well get worse. Therefore, Micah 7 verse 7 continues, Therefore, this is our response to those of us in these difficult situations. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Living alone, more difficult in these days. You're going to have fewer visitors. You're not going really to have any visitors. Living with unbelieving family members. And living even with your own children. Even if they're covenant children. Especially if your house is small. Or if you live in a flat. And the children are going to be tempted. And they're going to yield to it betimes. To fight with each other. And bicker. And it drives you up the wall and you're going to be praying for patience. For patience. And some of you are saying, Pastor, you don't know the tenth of it. And you're right, I, I don't. But I'm praying for you. The sixth petition. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I can't stand for a moment to paraphrase his question answer in 27. My enemies, the world, the flesh, the devil and my own flesh and blood. They're assaulting me. Lord, 
Please preserve and strengthen me by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be overcome in this spiritual warfare because it is a spiritual warfare too. Enable me constantly and strenuously to resist my foes so that I can attain a complete victory. If not in this world, certainly in the one to come. And in general, there's that temptation. There are those temptations which come from being cooped up in the house. Easy to become lazy and bored. And then it's easy to let yourself go and to start eating and eating, comfort eating. And then you put on, you put on weight, lots of weight. And that isn't good. It makes you feel bad. And there is also the sin of gluttony. And some people, trust not you, beloved, in the church, some people are buying in the drink. The off-licenses are doing a roaring trade, or at least the off-licenses in the supermarkets that can open. And there's going to be a lot of drunkenness, and in the world there's going to be domestic rows and fighting, and the police are going to be called in. Such is the totally depraved nature of man. And in your boredom, you may even be tempted to watch the rubbish on TV. That's how desperate you may become in your boredom. And I tell you what, you need to be desperate to watch that rubbish. I'm not talking now about some amazing programs about the creatures in the depths of the sea. They'll blot out the evolutionary folly. But sinful programs. And in your boredom, especially if you have too much time in the hands, and because of the sinful flesh, which ceases not to assault us, there's going to be temptation for some people of God, believers too, that's how sad it is, to indulge in pornography on your computer or smartphone. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The sixth petition says, lead us not into temptation. Do not yield or be overcome in that spiritual warfare either. Resist by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the crucified one, and mortify that sin. It'll kill you. And then, because God has made all of us different, there are some people who are, let's say, of the more antisocial tendency. And that can happen too. And they actually kind of like the quiet. And in a certain sense, we can all appreciate and understand that. And they actually may find it slightly better, or maybe quite a bit better. They don't have to go out, they don't have to meet people, because, because some of us struggle in meeting with people and are shy and find it easier and more relaxing just to stay in our homes. And then we need to guard against that temptation, reminding ourselves that it is true, after all, whether we like it or not, for some of us, that we are still part of the human race. Still part of the human race. And, which is even more important, I'm still a part of the body of Jesus Christ part of a body, I'm a member of a body. I mustn't cut myself off or rather like being cut off from other members. There's the communion of the saints. God has saved me as part of a body, a part of a church. It's not natural or usual to be isolated like this and I often become too comfortable being set apart. I've got to pray for the body, think of myself in that body, overcome some of my more antisocial or shy tendencies. And it ought to be said too that there are worse places in which to be confined or largely confined than one's own home. I mean, that's our own home. We've made it comfortable for ourselves. It is, at least for most of us, the way we like it. We've adopted it to suit us. There are other people, 
There are other people in jail. And you can't do much to make your jail cell homer. And for these people in jail in the days of the coronavirus, it's even worse because they have a lockdown in the jail. They're restricted even more than normally the case. And being in our own homes for long periods of time, and it's already a couple of weeks. World War II, the Battle of Britain, for instance, was a lot longer. And people had to spend all night in air raid shelters. Smelly, cold, damp, crying children, very uncomfortable. There's a lot worse than our current somewhat difficulties. And then there's Psalm 90 verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling places in all generations. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. That's what Moses said. That was his believing reflection during the wilderness wanderings. For he wrote the 90th Psalm. God, Jehovah, he is our dwelling place. I don't just dwell in a tent, said Moses, on the east of the entry to the tabernacle. I've been dwelling with God as all of God's people. From the salvation of Adam and Eve up until Moses' day and to the end of the age. And the believer says too, I dwell in God. I dwell in him because I'm united to Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. He is in me and I am in him. The covenant dwelling of fellowship. I dwell in God 24-7 even when I and my house are in lockdown. And when I say I'm in lockdown, it's not the worst thing in the world. I can cope with that by God's grace, says the believer. Though some, it's more a trial than others. I realize that. But there was one who wasn't just locked down, but nailed down. And he was nailed to a cross. That's some confinement. Unable to do much with his hands or feet. For six hours of sheer, unimaginable agony. Bad enough to have that form of execution at the hands of men as our Savior had. But many infinitely times worse to receive it at the hand of God, bearing our sins on his own body on the tree. There our Saviour entered hell, not by locally or as the place, descending into that pit. But the agony of hell came to him for us. And for our salvation. And this brings us beloved. To the third area of. Temptation. We've, we are tempted by the world. And the flesh. And the devil. Because first of all. We can't go to places. And do things in those places. As we once did. And then second. Because we're largely confined to our homes, or at least most of us are. And then the third temptation is then to worry about the future. And there is no temptation that befalls us except that which is common to mankind. And I wondered, beloved, as I prepared that ser this sermon, if it's wise to mention some of the things that we're tempted to worry about in these days. Many of them are issues that are perennial concerns. Some of them are heightened and some of them are slightly newer. You see, if you are a worrier, and I mention one thing that you hadn't thought of before, I'm not trying to be original here, then I might need you to worry about that too. 
but I'm afraid I'm going to have to take that risk. What about my health? What about the health of my family and friends? What about the church? Don't worry about the church. Christ is the head of the church. He'll take care of it. Don't worry about the other things too, but don't worry about that one either. What about the world? Look at the way it's going. And what do you see? There are all sorts of evil men who are going to use this to bring in ungodly laws. Probably. But there's not a big pie we can do about it. And worrying won't help. And what about my job? And what about money? And what about my bank account? Well, all you saints in the CPRC, we have a diaconate, and we have money too. Ask for help. We do not want you worrying about that. And here is some very practical that you can do. Let us know. Explain your situation. The deacons will not be obtrusive or nasty. We're here to help. Don't worry. Take practical steps if you need help. What about my children's education? What about holding a funeral if my loved ones die in these circumstances? What if there are food riots down the road? What if we all run out of toilet roll? If it is lawful, and that's an if, to worry about something, I would like you to think about this. If you have to be worried about something, I say this as your pastor, worry instead about backsliding. Huh? If you have to worry and you think, I can't, I have to worry about something, Worry about backsliding. That is, worry that not getting to church and not meeting with the other believers and thinking that you have a bit more freedom to maybe indulge your sins in the flesh. Worry about that. That might at least be a positive thing to worry about. But don't actually be worried about that either. Rather, be concerned about that as something that could happen given the fact that we're so weak in ourselves that we can't stand for a moment and our mortal enemies, the devil, the world and the flesh cease not to assault us and then use that worry about that spiritual declension that is, and not just changing the words now but changing the reality and the attitude a concern that in these circumstances I'm the sort of person who could slip here and then address that concern that lawful and proper concern by seeking the Lord and growing in grace. And in general, all of these worries, you have to quit it. What about this and what about the other thing and all this whataboutery? Jesus said, listen to it. And let the word sink in. Jesus said, Sufficient unto each day is the evil thereof. What does that mean? It means I have enough problems to face today. Jesus said they're sufficient. Sufficient for each day is the evil thereof. And if he says I have enough evils and difficulties and problems to face today, that I don't need to think about all these other evils and problems tomorrow. Well, you know what? He knows what he's talking about. I have enough to deal with today. Forget about all these other things. Let them go. Focus on the things that you can address right here and now. And let God take care of all these things. And he can care about your future and your children's future a lot better than you can. Believe that. That is true. Trust in him. He's a good father. He knows what he's doing. He's been fathering his church, providing and caring for each one for millennia. He loves you in Jesus Christ. And he says to you, all these things you're worrying about, they're not your business. They're not your business. You do not run a bank. You are not the head coach in the UK swimming team. 
No, of course I'm not. Of course I'm not. Yeah, well, you don't have to worry about the bank or the swimming team. And God says, I take care of the future. It's not your business. It's my business. Let me deal with it. Sufficient to you each day is the evil thereof. You deal with the problems and struggles of each day, not the future, and in your own sphere. And let me address the rest. What is Lord's Day 52 teaching us? Lead us not into temptation. Teaches us to pray, knowing our weakness, knowing our mortal enemies. Lord, preserve and strengthen us by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we're not overcome in this spiritual warfare or these temptations we're currently facing here and now. Constantly and strenuously enable me to resist my foes. And what about the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer? What does it mean? How does that help us? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. That is, all these we ask of thee because thou art our King and Almighty and thou art willing and able to give us all good and we pray for this so that thy holy name may be glorified forever. That's what counts. That's important. And what about the word Amen? What does that signify? It shall truly and certainly be. For my prayer is more assuredly heard of God than I feel in my heart that I even desire the things that I ask for. Let me leave you with this, beloved. The three chapters of the book of Habakkuk are all about trust, faith in the living God. It's in that connection that we have that famous line quoted by Paul in Romans 1, the just shall live by his faith. And how does this great book about faith and trust in the Lord in difficult circumstances When Judah was behaving wickedly, God was going to bring in the Babylonians to destroy them, and the Babylonians were even more wicked than Judah, and everything seemed to be going to the dogs. How does Habakkuk end the book? With faith and confidence. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labour of the olive shall fail, And the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. And there shall be no herd in the stalls. That is, if the economy is devastated. If we have little or nothing to eat. And everything goes to rack and ruin. What does Habakkuk say? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. That's faith and it's victory. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, use thy word to nourish and strengthen our faith, that we may battle against our temptations, that we may overcome, that we may understand, Lord God, that thou dost give wisdom to adapt ourselves to difficult circumstances in answer to prayer. And may thy grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and thy love and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.